Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is Bill Henry speaking to you from the floor of the House of Representatives in Washington, where we are awaiting the arrival of President Truman, who is to deliver his message to the joint meeting of the House of Representatives and the Senate of the United States. A very distinguished audience is already here. The floor of the House is filled. Every seat is filled to capacity. The members of the President's Cabinet have only just come in, and we are now awaiting the news from the doorkeeper that the President himself has arrived. He is in the building, but he has not yet come into the House chamber. A very distinguished gathering indeed is here. A very unusual group, almost complete from the Cabinet, the only missing member being the Secretary of the Interior, Mr. Krug, who was not able to be here. But otherwise, they were here and uh, advancing, incidentally, in their new order with the Secretary of Defense uh, following standing third on the list for the first time in a public appearance of the Cabinet. Mrs. Truman is here and is in the gallery waiting to hear her husband make his speech. The uh, President's secretaries have just come in, Charlie Ross, and now we're about to hear the message from the doorkeeper announcing the arrival of the President of the United States. He will be here in just a moment. The of the United States. That was the voice of the doorkeeper that you heard. Now the President is advancing down the aisle, accompanied by a committee from the House and the Senate. He's now in the well of the House. He's carrying his manuscript in his hand. He's stepping up, shaking hands now with... He's given a copy of his message to Senator Vandenberg. One of the speaker, he shakes hands with the speaker and with Senator Vandenberg. He certainly is receiving the greatest ovation of his career. He looks very businesslike indeed. And as soon as the applause has died down, he will be introduced. Everyone present is standing. What's the speaker's gavel? Members of the Congress, I have the distinguished honor of presenting to you the President of the United States. Mr. President, Mr. Speaker, members of the 80th Congress, the Congress has been convened to consider two problems of major concern to the citizens of the United States and to the peoples of the world. The future of the free nations of Europe hangs in the balance. The future of our own economy is in jeopardy. The action which you take will be written large in the history of this nation and of the world. The Secretary of State and other representatives of the executive branch have appeared before the committees of Congress during the past week to present the facts regarding the necessity for immediate assistance by the United States to certain European countries. Austria, France, and Italy have nearly exhausted their financial resources. They must be helped if their peoples are to survive the coming winter and if their political and economic systems are not to disintegrate. Exceedingly bad weather has brought on crop failures and fuel shortages and has caused intense suffering. The food and fuel stocks of these countries are now near the vanishing point. Their peoples are in a dangerously weakened condition due to years of short rations. Additional medical supplies and facilities are urgently necessary. Austria needs $42 million. Italy needs $227 million and France needs $328 million to buy food, fuel, and other essential goods during the next four and one-half months. Detailed information has been presented to your committee concerning these needs and the purposes for which the funds are to be appropriated by the Congress would be spent. Additional funds will also be required to maintain our position in occupied countries. Emergency assistance by itself 
will not solve the European problem. Emergency aid is no substitute for a long-range recovery program, but it is a vital prerequisite to such a program. If the Western European nations should collapse this winter as a result of our failure to bridge the gap between their resources and their needs, there would be no chance for them or for us to look forward to their economic recovery. The pr providing of interim aid will give us time to plan our part in an e economic recovery program, and it will give the peoples of Europe the strength to hold out until such a program begins. I will shortly submit to the Congress recommendations concerning the long-range European recovery program. This program is the result of the combined efforts of thoughtful men of two continents, whose concern has been the most effective manner in which 16 European nations, Western Germany and the United States, can work together for European recovery, world prosperity, and lasting peace. It is a tribute to the strength of our democracy that we are able to make so great a contribution to the freedom and welfare of other nations and other peoples. This nation is strong both in material resources and in the spirit of its people. Our economic strength, born of our system of free institutions, has contributed to raising the standards of living the world over. Our moral strength, resulting from our faith in human rights, is the inspiration of free men everywhere. I refer to the strength of this nation with humility, for it is an awe-inspiring truth that the manner in which we exert our strength now and in the future will have a decisive effect upon the course of civilization. There is a truth whose significance grows with the experience of each passing day. The American people are becoming more and more deeply aware of their world position. They are learning that great responsibility goes with great power. Our people know that our influence in the world gives us an opportunity unmatched in history to conduct ourselves in such a manner that men and women of all the world can move out of the shadows of fear and war and into the light of freedom and peace. We must make the most of that opportunity, for we have learned by the costly lesson of two world wars that what happens beyond our shores determines how we live our own lives. We have learned that if we want to live in freedom and security, we must work with all the world for freedom and security. Human misery and chaos lead to strife and conquest. Hunger and poverty tempt the strong to prey upon the weak. Twice within this generation we have had to take up arms against nations whose leaders, misled by the hope of easy conquest, sought to dominate the world. We are convinced that the best way to prevent future wars is to work for the independence and well-being of all nations. <laughs> This conviction guides our present efforts and will guide our future decisions. We have participated fully and gladly in the growth of the United Nations, and we seek now to strengthen and improve it. We are assisting free nations who have sought our aid in maintaining their independence. We have contributed large sums to help rebuild countries devastated by war. We have taken the lead in breaking down barriers to world trade. In our efforts, however, to achieve the conditions of peace for all the world, 
we have encountered unforeseen and most unwelcome obstacles. We have found that not all nations seem to share our aims or approve our methods. We regret the differences which have arisen and the criticism so loudly expressed. Yet we cannot afford and we do not intend to let current differences with some nations deter our efforts to cooperate in friendly fashion and to assist other nations who, like us, cherish freedom and seek to promote the peace and stability of the world. The actions of this government must be of a statute to match the dignity and influence of the United States in world affairs. The prompt provision by the Congress for interim aid will be convincing proof to all nations of our sincere determination to support the freedom-loving countries of Western Europe in their endeavors to remain free and to become fully self-supporting once again. If that action is followed by the enactment of the long-range European recovery program, this Congress will have written a noble page in the world annals. I've spoken of the economic and moral strength of the United States and of the way in which we must use that strength if we are to build a world community, free, strong, and independent nations. The strength of the United States is not due to change. It is due to the wise decisions and bold actions taken by free and courageous men throughout the history of our democracy. The time is at hand for new decisions and new actions of equal wisdom. On several occasions during the past year, I have reported to the Congress and to the nation on our general economic situation. These reports have told of new high levels of production and employment. Farmers are producing 37 percent more than in 1929. Industry is producing 65 percent more. In terms of actual purchasing power, the average income of individuals after taxes has risen 39 percent. The rapid growth of our post-war economic activity has exceeded expectations and has revealed anew the potentialities of our economy. In each of my reports, however, I have had to warn of dangers which lay ahead. Today, inflation stands as an ominous threat to the prosperity we have achieved. We can no longer treat inflation with spiraling prices and living costs as some vague condition we may encounter in the future. We already have an alarming degree of inflation. And even more alarming, it is getting worse. Since the middle of 1946, fuel has gone up 13 percent. Clothing prices have gone up 19 percent. Retail food prices have gone up 40 percent. The average for all cost of living items has risen 23 percent. The housewife who goes to buy food today must spend ten dollars to buy what seven dollars bought a year and a half ago. She must spend ten dollars to buy what seven dollars would have bought a year and a half ago. The cost of living is still climbing. In the past four months, it has risen at the rate of 16 percent a year. Wholesale prices are rising, too. They affect every industry and trade, and they are soon translated into retail prices. Since the middle of 1946, wholesale textile prices have gone up 32 percent. Metals have gone up 36 percent. Building materials have gone up 42 percent. Wholesale prices on the average have gone up 40 percent. The harsh effects of price inflation are clear. 
They are felt by wage earners, farmers, and businessmen. Wage earners are finding that bigger paychecks this year buy less than smaller paychecks bought last year. Despite generalities about high farm prices, the income of many farm families cannot keep up with the rising costs of the things they buy. Small businessmen are being squeezed by rising costs. Even those who are well off are asking, how long can it last? When is the break coming? In addition, price inflation threatens our entire program of foreign aid. We cannot abandon foreign aid, nor can we abandon our own people to the ravages of unchecked inflation. We cannot allow the strength of this nation to be wasted and our people's confidence in our free institutions to be shaken by an economic catastrophe. We shall be inviting that catastrophe unless we take steps now to halt runaway prices. Our immediate approach to the problems of high prices and inflation should consist of three types of measures. One, to relieve monetary pressures. Two, to cancel scarce, to channel scarce goods into the most essential uses. Three, to deal directly with specific high prices. The way to reduce monetary pressure is by restraining the excessive use of credit. At a time when the economy is already producing at capacity, a further expansion of credit simply gives people more dollars to use in bidding up the prices of goods. Consumer credit is increasing at a disturbing rate. The amount outstanding has risen from six and one half billion dollars in 1945 to more than 11 billion dollars today. Even more rapid expansion is underway now because the controls on consumer credit exercised by the Federal Reserve System expired November the 1st. These credit controls should be restored. Also, some restraints should be placed on inflationary bank credit. Legislation is required, moreover, to pre prevent excessive speculation on the commodity exchanges. Another effective weapon against inflation is increased savings by the public. Every dollar that is saved instead of spent is a dollar fighting against inflation. In order to encourage additional savings, the government should intensify its vigorous efforts to sell savings bonds. The second part of the program to curb inflation is to secure the most efficient use of scarce goods and otherwise channel their flow so as to relieve inflationary pressures. Grain, for example, is too badly needed to permit wasteful feeding to livestock. Steel, as another example, is too scarce to be used for non-essential purposes. Legislation is required to authorize the allocation of scarce commodities, which basically affect the cost of living, or basically affect industrial production. In these limited areas, inventory control powers are also needed. Authority to allocate transportation services should be extended. In addition, existing export control should be continued and strengthened. Goods that we cannot wisely export must be kept here, and the shipments we make must go where they are needed most. Profiteering in exports must be prevented. The menace which I have already discussed will, the measures which I have already discussed, will, when taken together, aid substantially in relieving inflationary pressures. For large segments of the economy, they should be adequate to meet the requirements of the present situation. However, there are limited areas of acute danger in which these measures cannot be regarded as guaranteeing adequate protection. For example, present forecasts indicate that we are likely to have less grain and meat next year than we have this year. 
the pressure on the prices of these foods would then become increasingly great. If these pressures are permitted to bring further sharp increases in food prices, they may well set off a chain reaction that would spread throughout the economy. It is surely better to take timely action to check adverse forces at particular trouble spots than to wait until general inflation has become so serious as to require drastic controls over the whole economic life. Therefore, we need a third group of measures to combat inflation. Legislation should be enacted authorizing the government to impo impose price ceilings on vital commodities in short supply that basically affect the cost of living. Basic elements in the cost of living are food, clothing, fuel, and rent. In addition, the legislation should be broad enough to authorize price ceilings on those vital commodities in short supply that basically affect industrial production. This will enable us to stamp out profiteering and speculation in these important areas. This does not mean that price ceilings should be imposed on all items within the classes I have mentioned. For example, price ceilings would not be necessary for staple food and clothing items not in short supply or for any delicacies or luxury. The same principle of selective treatment would apply to industrial items. This selective treatment of a relatively few danger spots is very different from overall wartime price control. Even should the shortages of a few commodities at the consumer level remain serious for a time, I believe that the fair distribution of such commodities can be largely accomplished without consumer rationing. But no one can foretell exactly how serious some shortages may become next year. With serious shortages, a free market works cruel hardships on countless families and puts an unbearable pressure on prices. I therefore recommend that authority be granted as a preparedness measure to ration basic cost of living items on a highly selective basis. Adequate protection from high prices and unfair distribution can be assured only by establishing authority for price ceiling and rationing in the fields of critical importance. It takes several months to set up an organization and make the administrative arrangements necessary to put price control and rationing into effect. Thus, the only prudent course is to establish the authority at this time so the necessary preparations can be started. If we fail to prepare and disaster results from our unpreparedness, we shall have gambled with our national safety and loss. If the government imposes price ceilings covering a specific area of production, it should in all fairness have the authority in that same area to prevent wage increases, which will make it impossible to maintain price ceiling. This authority should be granted, although I believe that there would be few occasions for its use. I am confident that if the cost of living can be brought and held in reasonable relationship to the incomes of the people, wage adjustments through collective bargaining will be consistent with productivity and will avoid an inflationary round of wage increases. Next to food, the most important element in the cost of living is rent. Under the modified rent control law, rents are rising at the rate of about 1% a month. A 12% annual increase in rent imposes an intolerable strain upon the family budget. The rent control law should be extended and the weaknesses in the present law should be corrected. I am well aware that some of my proposals are drastic measures. No one regrets more than I the necessity for considering their use. But if we face the facts squarely, it is apparent that no other methods can safely be counted upon to protect our people from the dangers of excessively high prices and ruinous inflation. The American people want adequate protection from these dangers, and they are entitled to it. It should not be denied them. 
nor should they be misled with half measures, even with the authority to impose price ceiling. The government will intensify its efforts to obtain voluntary action. Wherever voluntary action will do the job, there will be no necessity to impose the government's authority. But the very existence of these powers should have a salutary effect. They will demonstrate to each of our citizens the importance of carefully weighing each step that might lead to higher prices. They will support expanded and more specific efforts to obtain voluntary action by businessmen, labor leaders, farmers, and consumers to hold prices down. All of the actions I have described are essential to a fair and effective anti-inflation program. I look upon them as short-run insurance against the impairment of our prosperity and the threat to our future development. We should all ponder the following question. What would it avail a farmer in the long run if farm prices should go substantially higher, only to be followed by a disaster such as occurred after the First World War? What would it avail a worker in the long run to obtain inflationary wage increases if they were followed by a repetition of the bitter experience when 15 million workers were out of jobs? What would it avail the businessman to have record-breaking profits soar even higher if they were followed by a depression which would imperil our whole system of enterprise. The program which I have outlined is one designed to meet the existing emergencies of inflation and exorbitant price levels. It is an emergency program which should be adopted to protect our standard of living for the immediate present and to make possible economic security in the future. But a program designed to meet a crisis cannot by itself be a program designed to build for the future. We must also make plans to prevent future difficulty of the same nature. Our long-range programs must stress ever-increasing production. To accomplish this for agriculture, we need a comprehensive farm program. We shall need programs to increase the use of farm products by industry and the consumers in this country when other countries become more nearly self-sufficient. Long-range national measures will be needed to protect the farm population against ruinous deflation in farm production and prices. To expand industrial output, we need a long-range program to overcome basic shortages in capacity and equipment. To provide markets for increased output of farm and factory, we shall need long-range programs to raise the standard of living particularly for families of low income. But the first step toward this program in the future is to deal with the critical present. We must win the battle against inflation so that our long-range efforts may start from high levels of prosperity and not from the depths of a depression. In summary, the immediate anti-inflation program that I recommend calls for the following legislative action. One, to restore consumer credit control and to restrain the recreation of inflationary bank credit. Two, to authorize the regulation of speculative trading on the commodity exchanges. Three, to extend and strengthen export controls. Four, to extend authority to allocate transportation facilities and equipment. Five, to authorize measures which will induce the marketing of livestock and poultry at weights and grades that represent the most efficient utilization of grain. Six, to enable the Department of Agriculture to expand its program of encouraging conservation practice in this country and to authorize measures designed to increase the production of foods in foreign countries. Seven, to authorize allocation and inventory control of scarce commodities which basically affect the cost of living or industrial production. Eight, to extend and strengthen rent control. Nine, to authorize consumer rationing on products in short supply, which basically affect the cost of living. Ten, to authorize price ceilings on products in short supply, 
which basically affect the cost of living or industrial production and to authorize such wage ceilings as are essential to maintain the necessary price ceiling. If we neglect our economic ills at home, if we fail to halt the march of inflation, we may bring on a depression from which our economic system as we know it might not recover. And if we turn our backs on nations still struggling to recover from the agony of war, not able, not yet able to stand on their own feet, we may lose for all time the chance to obtain a world of free people that can live in enduring peace. The freedom that we cherish in our own economy and the freedom that we enjoy in the world today are both at stake. I have recommended interim aid for certain Western European countries and a program to curb inflation in the United States. I regard the measures which I have presented to you as vital and essential to the welfare of this nation. When the American people have faced decisions of such magnitude in the past, they have taken the right course. I am confident that the Congress, guided by the will of the people, will take the right course on this occasion. The audience is rising now. The president is standing, bowing. The audience both on the floor and in the gallery. He is now shaking hands with the Speaker of the House, with Senator Vandenberg, He's smiling, shaking hands with some of the other dignitaries around here. He's stepping down from the rostrum, and the president is now moving through the well of the House, speaking to the various members of the cabinet. And he is now about to start up the center aisle and leave the floor of the building. The applause is very strong, perhaps str perhaps stronger in the gallery than uh, on the floor, although it seems to be strong on both sides. I think you find that the natural reaction of the members on the floor is that they have a very serious matter here to consider. And now for the reaction to the, what might be called the foreign affairs elements of the speech. Here is Joseph C. Harsh. I think that the world outside and the diplomatic corps here in Washington and people like that are going to be interested in this speech primarily because of the tone in which it was delivered and his choice of material. Uh, it is rather significant that the president's way of handling his foreign affairs uh, problems this time uh, is not at all as he did it when he first faced this current world issue of American relations with Russia last March. The Truman Doctrine at that time was stated in rather stark and sharp terms. Uh, I think it's rather like a, a, a statue. At that time it was chiseled out only in the rougher, sharper, more dangerous aspects of it. You saw the anti-communist feature standing out most profoundly and strongly. Now, this time, the president has taken the foreign policy issue which faces the nation and not understated it, but stated it with a degree of refinement and care that didn't exist in that original Truman Doctrine speech. That was a negative approach to the problem. It put the emphasis on our troubles with Russia. It specified communism as an enemy. Now, that is not toned down in this, but it is allowed to go without being mentioned. The emphasis in this speech is entirely on the constructive aspect, on the relationship between America and the Western world and the common stake that America and the Western world have together in peace and freedom. The speech is strong uh, in its statement of philosophy in general and constructive terms. It is, of course, a, an internationalist speech as opposed to a nationalist speech. It looks to closer relations uh, between this country and the Western world rather than to the sense of conflict between us and Russia. In other words, it seems to me that the speech shows a response to a good deal of criticism that's come out against the Truman Doctrine since it was first phrased. That criticism was largely on the ground that the doctrine was negative, not positive or constructive. In this speech, the president has been constructive. I think that he is most constructive 
uh, taking it from the point of view of people overseas who will be watching this for its effect on their own lives, in terms of the relative time he assigned to his foreign policy and domestic uh, parts of the speech. Uh, it ran seven pages of text. Only the first two pages were, dire were devoted to foreign affairs. Uh, his, uh, it would seem as though he were almost assuming that the idea of foreign aid had ceased to be a very controversial subject. He is going to the controversial issue of measures to be taken in America to implement the Truman Doctrine. He devotes five-sevenths of his speech to that. Uh, it should, I think, have a most encouraging effect in Britain, in France, uh, in Italy, and places like that, because they will read it as a preoccupation on the part of Washington with the serious mechanical steps which must be taken if the, the Marshall Plan is to put, be put through. Uh, the original Truman Doctrine of last March uh, was a... So at that time was hardly more than a gesture. It was very easy for somebody to say, this is fine, but what does it mean? There's no proof that you're going to do anything about it. This time the president is concentrating on what me must be done if something is to be done about the problems of the world. It's no use saying that we're going to oppose Russia if we're not going to be strong enough at home to oppose Russia. What the president is doing here is putting his emphasis, I think, on the effort to mobilize American economy in order that the measures can be taken which would, uh, if taken and if if successful and if they worked out as they're supposed to work out, uh, would achieve the purpose of the Truman Doctrine. That purpose being to create between Russia and the United States uh, a, an economic and political entity uh, to translate the present vacuum which Western Europe is into something of strength, something which will be a bulwark between us and Russia. Now this speech is, I think, very well suited to that purpose. It, um, it does not give the communist propagandists very many handholds. Uh, as I said before, he has not mentioned communism in it once. Uh, the absence of the negative, of the anti, of the hostile approach, uh, is, is uh, an effort to adjust our uh, political, American political position to give a minimum of possible advantage to the opponent. Now, he's done that. He's put his emphasis on the constructive things. Uh, he has not, uh, this will be noted significantly, too, I think, he has not in any prominent way, in any way which, to which you could point, uh, yet offered what could be called an olive branch to the opposition. Uh, there has been a movement developing for a couple of weeks among those uh, who criticize the uh, present tendency in Washington to say that an effective foreign policy should have firmness in one hand and friendliness in the other. Uh, going back to Teddy Roosevelt's old idea of walking with a big stick in one hand and, uh, a fir and, and gentleness in the other. Uh, what, what Teddy said, uh, walk softly but carry a big stick. Uh, this is talking softly. Uh, the stick is there all right, but nobody is pointing to the stick. The president simply expresses the existence of the stick by the very firmness with which he calls upon America to do what he is now convinced must be done. That, that is, um, is in itself a, a change, a change toward the constructive side. It takes American foreign policy more into harmony with what people in, uh, in Europe and uh, particularly Britain would like to see American policy be. I think the net effect of this is going to increase very materially the confidence in Western Europe in the probability of America carrying out the Marshall Plan. Now back to Bill Henry. That was Joseph C. Harsh giving you the reaction to the foreign affairs elements in the president's speech. And now to give you something of a reaction to the domestic elements, here is Winston Burdett. Well, Bill, I think the recommendations which the president made on prices and inflation were the most eagerly awaited portion of his message today. Everyone knew pretty well in advance how the European aid program was going to shape up. It had already been outlined by Secretary Marshall, and the total bill had already been announced. 
But Congress did not know what powers the president would demand or what special measures he would recommend to keep the cost of living in check here at home while we went to Europe's aid. These recommendations were kept an official cabinet secret until an hour before the president delivered his message. And his anti-inflation program does contain several major surprises. In his own words, it is a drastic program with sweeping recommendations on the price front. Uh, the president calls for the revival of price controls on the consumer level, for price ceilings on certain selected vital commodities that are in short supply and that basically affect the cost of living. He also asks for authority to impose consumer rationing, again in certain critical fields. This as a kind of weapon to be held in reserve just in case rationing should be found necessary at some future time. Well, all told, this is a challenging program for the Democratic president to present now to the Republican Congress. Most of his other proposals are rather less drastic. For example, it was pretty generally expected that the president would ask for a revival of the government's powers to allocate key materials like steel and grain. Both steel and grain are vital items in any Euro European recovery program, and both are in short supply in this country. Also, the president's request for continued export controls and for a renewal of controls over consumer credit and for rent controls. All this is pretty much in line with what his economic experts have been proposing in recent weeks. It's hard to say how the Republican majority in Congress will react to all phases of this program. Most Republican leaders have been very careful not to tip their hand on the matter of prices. They preferred to wait and see what the president would propose. They have not yet formulated any program of their own. But we do know that Republicans in Congress have been studying some measures of the kind that Mr. Truman suggested today. Senator Taft, for instance, has talked about continuing export controls. And Taft has agreed that it might be necessary to revive some strong allocation system over certain vital, scarce materials. Taft has also said that he is keeping an open mind on the question of rationing. He's still willing to be convinced there. But, and it's a pretty big but, Taft, under no circumstances, would accept the restoration of price controls. So he has said. Well, as we expected, the president in this message gave precedence to his request for emergency aid to Europe over his program for combating inflation. And there are two good reasons for that. One is, of course, that Europe's need is immediate. And the other reason is that the anti-inflation program is a good deal more controversial. The president does not want to endanger the program for aid to Europe by opening this special session with what might be a long and partisan debate on what to do about prices. The Republicans, both in the House and Senate, seem to be ready to go along with him on this. They are giving top priority to emergency aid to Europe. The anti-inflation program will come up later, perhaps in this special session, perhaps only when Congress reconvenes for its regular session in January. In, in that connection, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee has set next Monday as its target date for opening debate on aid to Europe. It hopes to have an interim aid bill ready by then. And the debate in the Senate is expected to go on for perhaps three or four weeks. Well, that will take us well into December, and the Republican leadership is hoping to adjourn the special session by December 19th. This would leave only a few days before the Christmas holidays to tackle the problem of prices, the second and longer part of the president's message. Well, Congress may be able to make a start on the problem, but it's still a question whether it will deal with it comprehensively at this special session. Ladies and gentlemen, you have heard uh, the president's speech from the Congress of the United States. This special broadcast has come to you from CBS Public Affairs. Young Dr. Malone, presented by the makers of Crisco, Guiding Light, presented by the makers of Does, and the second Mrs. Burton, presented by the makers of La France and Satina, were not broadcast today due to the special program you have just heard. Tune in for Young Dr. Malone, Guiding Light, and the second Mrs. Burton at their regularly scheduled times tomorrow. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.